recognize that tune, and you know it's time for Relics Radio. This is a family-friendly show, so the entire family can join us as we talk metal detecting and relic hunting. You can call in to the show at 270-495-0315, or join in the chat and post any comments or questions you might have, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. You're listening to Relics Radio of Southern Kentucky and Middle Tennessee. All right, we're live again. But we're back in southern Kentucky and middle Tennessee after our Virginia trip. I am your host, Digging with Seven. And I'm your co-host, Tennessee Jeff. How you doing tonight, Jeff? Uh, pretty, pretty good. Uh, kind of got a bug while I was up there in Virginia, but uh, hopefully it won't last but uh, at least a couple more days anyway. Well, hope it goes away while we're on this show, but I mean, <laughs> it's, it's been pretty rough. But I mean, I don't know allergies or what but uh I, I guess it was that long walk we had to walk uh going back to the new york camp so i'd say that, that maybe what it is i'd say that didn't help anything <laughs> i'd say not uh i talked to uh, i'd say it didn't i talked to butch holcomb the other night uh monday night and he uh on their show and he said <laughs> he said lloyd tell me how that that walk back to the new york camp is two miles uphill going there and three miles uphill coming back i told him i said i don't know but uh, <laughs> it sure felt like it sure did it sure did but it it's, sure uh, did and go ahead no i mean it's of course, uh, the hill after you walking out of the parking area. Of course, a lot of our uh, listeners they 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 were wasn't there to see what we were going through. But I mean, going downhill from the parking area, it seemed like you walked about a mile going downhill. Then you had walked two miles going up, and then it seemed like twice as long coming back. So especially after you'd spent all day back there digging and uh, walking around. So I mean, it was pretty rough, but. I mean, if if you took your time walking up and down the hills, I mean, you you would be pretty good. So coming back, but, I mean, coming back didn't bother me as much as going up because that first hill after well we went downhill, and then got down in a little holler there. But then that hill going up to the actual camp, I had to stop two or three times and uh, catch my breath. I tell you, it it winded me quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Oh, it did. And as soon as you started uh, coming up the hill and you was walking off into the woods and you were like, man, I'm almost to the flat. I'm almost to the flat. And then then you'd have just a little bit more. And then you finally made it to the top. (laughs) I'd tell everybody, you just have to wait on me a little bit. There was a guy following me and I stopped and he was younger than I, not a whole lot, I don't guess. And he said, oh, no, man, don't stop, don't stop. He said, you've been my inspiration. I thought if he can do it, I can do it. I said, well, go ahead and say it, the old man. You know? <laughs> we got. A, there you go. Yeah, looks like we got a few people coming in. Jeff, who we got on chat? Yeah, we got Bill there. Here, there's Earl. How you doing, Earl? Uh, there's, uh, hey, there's Tim. Uh, we talked to him earlier today. Uh, Dennis, uh Let's see. I seen uh, Matt Purdue in there. Hello, Matt and Kimbo. So we, yeah, we've got a house full right now. So yeah, I seen I mean, Dennis. I don't know if you uh, mentioned him, Bill Leonard. My chat will uh, it'll freeze up here in a little bit. But uh, yeah, we got a lot of people. I noticed when we first started that uh, wasn't anybody in. I thought everybody uh, might have forsaken us a little bit there. Paul Forsay is in. Yeah, yeah, he just showed up. So hello, and there's Woody. How you doing, Woody? Yeah, Woody called in uh, the other night whenever we were in digging with uh, Virginia there in uh, Culpeper at the Best Western. I tell you what, Jeff, I like it a whole lot better being in the uh, studio here in the loft than I did. Of course, it was it was a lot of fun. I enjoyed doing it. But now I've got everything where it's supposed to be, and you know it's kind of second nature to look around at everything got a bigger board and and all of that so it it's it's a little bit better being here but uh i thought we had a great show last week didn't you yeah i sure do i mean it was a great show we had a lot of great guests and uh it was kind of neat having uh everybody out in front of us and uh 
of course we had the guys uh matt and a couple of them they come up and talked and uh of course we had earl on there and then uh we had a uh, missouri mike and then jeff he uh jeff ford plugmaster ford he helped out a lot so i mean but it was kind of nice having everybody in front of us and uh we done the Facebook Live, and that was pretty neat. Um, we had a lot of uh, views and comments on the Facebook Live. I thought so, it was too. Uh, it uh, yeah, yeah. I went back and uh, and watched part of that. I haven't watched all of it, but I watched part of it. And somebody told me that they were watching the Facebook Live uh, on video and then listening to the uh, podcast because if you were on Facebook Live, you couldn't hear the callers. And uh, you could hear everybody in the room fairly well. I mean, you couldn't uh, you couldn't hear them like you can here, but uh, it it was neat. I enjoyed it, sure did, and I, I appreciate uh, Plugmaster Ford doing that for us. What do you think about the hunt, Jeff? Well, at first, uh, I kind of had mixed feelings. I mean, of course, it was a new farm as uh, as far as I know has never been hunted by a. Uh, div hunt before and it took everybody a little while to hone in on the spots and of course it wasn't a winter camp that was one thing about it you you didn't have uh like the huts or uh big trash pits where they'd been there all winter long and uh but after the second day people started finding a few more things and then um of course me you and i we didn't make it to the uh lunch on the last day but the way i hear it and uh the pictures I've seen, they were a lot of great finds found. I mean, of course, I didn't find but one bullet, and normally, I mean, I find several bullets on a DIV hunt. And but uh, we did end up finding a couple of decent finds, and that uh, trash pit on the last day that that saved our hunt. So I mean, we've got some nice suspender clips out of it, and uh, of course, I, that's where I found my only uh, one bullet that I'd found, and then uh, I got that. Uh, into a uh, Civil War pen. Uh, what 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 did you call that, uh, Lloyd? What was the name of that? I called it a stylus, but then Monday night on uh, American Digger Magazine, uh, Relic Roundup, they called it a, did they call it a, a bib or something like that? Somebody will have to help us out. Uh, yeah, I thought, well, I was looking it up, and then I seen nips. Okay. And, uh, I mean, of course, it well, was a couple other things that he called it, but, I mean, we're just two rednecks with a metal detector. It was the end of an ink pen, that's and that's right. what it was. It's the end of an ink <laughs> pen. And uh, Butch Holcomb, he, and by the way, appreciate Butch uh, coming on and being with us live there in, in the Best Western. That's classy for him to. Yeah, what uh, about that? I mean, uh, I feel I feel famous now. We had somebody famous on our show, so I mean, <laughs> hey, <laughs> that was pretty good. And yeah, it really was. But uh, he said some of those are made of gold, and I told him I said, well, this one's not. It, it appears to be brass to me. But uh, and yeah. I I kind of hate to say it, but whenever I was in school. We use some of those tips on our <laughs> ink pens that had the two. It's got two little bitty balls and then a slot in between them, and it it actually held the ink, you know. And uh, yeah, I hate to say it, but uh, I've used one of those. <laughs> I told you, I told you, you you used all this stuff. So <laughs> I didn't know what the official but, name for it was. I just always called it an ink pen. So. Uh, I guess I can get by with that though, because technically that's what it is. Hey guys, I put the yeah, that's uh, what it is. I put the call in number in, and I see Jeff just put it in again two seven zero four nine five zero three one five. If you were at digging in Virginia forty, uh, we want you to give us a call and uh, tell us your impression of the hunt. If you weren't there, you're more than welcome to call and and uh, talk to us about uh, what you saw last week on the uh, on the podcast or what you saw. Me and Jeff did a couple of live Facebooks when we were digging that pit, and uh, that's the first time that we have ever done that. Yeah, I got to looking at them, and I was like, man, my hat's turned around sideways, and then my hair's sticking out here, and then, of course, I was like, we got to kind of watch how we do the Facebook Live. We never know what we're going to get on the uh, on the picture there. But uh, I ran the first one. About, it, I mean, it it was a good thing. I like it. Yeah, I do too. 
I didn't turn my camera sideways and I was able to download those and uh, I want to use them in our video of that hunt, which uh, it'll take us, it won't be out this next Tuesday. It'll probably be the Tuesday after that because it takes me a while to edit everything and, and figure out how we want to put it together. But I wish I'd have turned the camera uh, horizontal and uh, Plugmaster Ford always fusses about that. And I should have done that. <laughs> he did that with his Facebook Live, and it's, you know, you, you get the full uh, spectrum of it. You're not just, uh, you know, just up and down vertical. You've got a horizontal shot there. But, you well, know, yeah. like like you said there a while ago, this was not a winter camp. This was a summer camp. Uh, they didn't stay there very long. There wasn't a uh, a million soldiers there. I think the Vermont camp may have only had what did what they say that they had. I'm not a hundred percent sure. I mean, I was. Uh, I don't know how many soldiers were there. I mean, if uh, Earl from Virginia, he may he may know. And then, of course, if, if uh, you heard that question, Earl, just uh, if you don't mind, help us out there. Yeah, our but, call- uh, I know we had the Vermont camp, and then. Uh, the New York camp, of course, I mean, being from New York, it probably had to be several soldiers, I'm sure, because, I mean, that was pretty heavily populated area back then, so I'm really not for sure. Yeah, I don't yeah. I don't know how many that they how many that they had there, but I was surprised. Uh, somebody said they only stayed there three days. I was thinking that they stayed there just a, a little bit more. Uh, Earl said he wasn't for sure on the number, but it was the 5th Vermont and the 77th New York. And Mm -hmm. you know the one thing I wanted to find, don't you, Jeff? Oh, yeah, you sure. And you hunted, you hunted till the last minute trying to find that New York button. And, uh, I was sure trying to find one too, but I mean, I was, I was hoping you would find one. I mean, I would rather you'd found one of the, I hadn't found one myself, so. It I mean, didn't... I know how bad you wanted one, so. yeah, I, but it I... didn't work out. No, it didn't. You got that one button in the pit, and then, I mean, you was jumping up and down. You sure thought you had one. I so. did. I mean, whenever I first looked at it, when I turned it over, I I still thought it was a New York button, and then I saw how, uh, how thin that it was, you know. It didn't have the dome on it, and uh, yeah, it just, uh, it just didn't work out. Now, uh, Earl from Virginia. He was in our group. Uh, we all three roomed together and, uh, we drove to the site together. Actually, Earl was, had the uh, driving pass, but we took my vehicle cause we had a little bit more room in it, but Earl got the find of the hunt, didn't he? Between he us. He sure did. I mean, he, yep. He found that beautiful, uh, U S box plate. I mean, that was, I mean, it was a great find. It was in good shape too. And then of course, he'd went down to the uh, river, and then uh, I'd seen, if you hadn't seen his videos, uh, of course, it's Earl from Virginia on YouTube, and uh, he'd put his uh, DIV40 video up, and uh, of course, he was down at the river, and it was a canal, a canal running through there, and I mean, you could tell where the canal went and everything, and then uh, uh, there was a little spring area coming out, and then uh, I don't want to give it all away, you just have to go watch his video, but I mean, it was a uh, nice box plate he dug. And he he done pretty good on the hunt. He found a uh, lot of uh, neat iron relics too, while he was up there at the uh, parking area. So where that guy found that uh, uh, Confederate wreath. So. Yeah, guys, uh, I'll uh, I'll let you in on <laughs> a little secret and uh, file this away in your mind because it's probably going to happen to you someday. Right there where everybody parked was the best place to hunt. Uh, there was evidently an old house out there. Barb found a, uh, large scent there and, uh, that was her first large scent. So that was good. Barb found a, uh, New York button up on the, uh, New York camp on top of the hill. And that was her first New York button. So that was a great find for her. But then, uh, there was a, a guy that was using a, an Equinox. He got it out right there where the cars were parked. And I know that first day he found that reef. He found two large scents. Uh, there were some reals found there. there. There was just a ton of stuff. And by the way, the uh, the Equinox was probably the best machine there. Uh, it wasn't a typical GPX site, was it? 
It, it sure wasn't. I mean, the ground wasn't near as hot as it is around Culpeper. Uh, of course, we, what was it? Uh, we were in Warren. Is, uh, that was the county, I believe. And uh, the ground, I mean, it was pretty pretty neutral. And uh, you get around Culpeper, Brandy Station, Beauregard. I mean, you get all around them farms, and that that uh, uh, ground's just as red as red can be. And then, but this ground, I mean, it was it was good ground to hunt in, and you could use a VLF machine and do very well. I know, uh, I y'all were back at the New York camp, and uh, it was later in the day, and I found a iron patch right next to the edge of the road, and I'd walked across it with my GPX, and I mean, it was just total null out i mean you couldn't use the gpx so i'd got my at pro out and used it for a little bit and i ended up finding a couple of pieces of uh lead but nothing real real good but i mean you never know it could have been a honey hole like that uh the last gentleman found up there at the parking area i mean it was just so many square nails there you couldn't use the gpx but i mean it was one one thing it was one thing that we didn't realize until probably uh, at least midway through the second day was that the bullets were nulling on the GPXs. And that was because we had uh, our iron reject turned up too high. I had mine all the way up on 10. And uh, then there was a guy came and he said, uh, those bullets are nulling on gpx he said you need to turn he said what are you running your iron reject and i said 10 he said turn it down to four and uh so i did and i found a couple of of shallow bullets the bullets were shallow uh for the most part weren't they yeah they sure were i mean i know uh, you had hornbush and randy Shoal. they were hunted site two just about the whole hunt and they were digging bullets at no deeper than two inches deep and then some of them they said you'd just scrape the leaves back and they'd be laying on top of the ground and i mean it was they said they were gnawing uh gnawing on them too and then uh earl speaking of vlf he he used a vlf machine the whole hunt and he done better than we did so that there you go i mean of course it was kind of hard uh seven and i we had talked and it was kind of hard to hunt and not hunt with your best machine. So, I mean, it, yeah. we could have used our AT Pro for the whole hunt, but, I mean, we kind of wanted to use our best machine. So, I know the GPX is going to go a lot deeper than the AT Pro and a lot of your VLF machines. But, I mean, it's just you you could have used a VLF machine and like Earl did and do a lot better than we did. So. Uh, me and Jeff did both use a six inch coil, went to a six inch coil on our uh, GPXs. And uh, I did better whenever I went to that and I turned my gain down to about five. I actually ran four a few times. And uh, that little six inch coil was great for me because uh, my best find was a watch winder up on the New York camp. And it was probably close to eight inches deep. It was kind of rare, you know, that uh, we found anything that deep. But, man, it was screaming and just as clear as a bell. So, you know, I've got uh, I've got some confidence in that coil. And I had borrowed one off Hornbush, and then you used Hornbushes. And I actually, mm-hmm. I actually bought one and uh, d- didn't decide until Monday that I wanted one to take there and try. And uh, Heath Jones got a hold of uh, Keith at Fort Bedford, and then Tony brought it to the pre-hunt, and I picked it up there. But I'm glad that I did. I I really, really do like that coil, and I can't wait to get back in the 44 Woods with that coil and, and try it and see what else I can find there. But, you know, I, the more I think about it, I think that the Tompkinsville camp is a lot like the camp that we hunted there uh, because whenever I turned my game down there a whole lot, I started picking up some bullets, and I think they were nulling on me prior to, to adjusting that. So I probably need to turn my iron reject down there as well. Yeah, I mean, it sounds a lot like it. And, uh, of course, the few times I've hunted the 44 woods and stuff, I mean, I would use the uh, 8, well, what is it, 11-inch call, and then uh, – course i would miss a few things and then you'd go back over it with your gain turned down and then you found 
uh, more bullets where we'd already been. So, I mean, it it may be the same. And then, like, if we go over a shallow bullet, they may be nulling out, and then we just think they're iron. So, But I know a lot of people say, well, just dig everything. But, I mean, you can dig everything, but uh, it gets you get tired real quick of bent, getting up and down, up and down. So, I mean, that's what we use the iron reject for. And I know you're supposed to dig everything, but sometimes you just uh, – you have them days where you just don't feel like digging everything. So, well, dig everything is kind of it's kind of relative. If you're in a spot and you know that you've got a lot of nails, and then you dig four or five of them, and you know how they sound, and then you dig a good target, and you know how it sounds, uh, you've got to get some uh, a little bit of a smooth signal on that GPX or. Otherwise, you're going to sit in one spot and dig a hundred nails, and and then you're wasting your hunt. Now, around here, that really doesn't yeah. doesn't make a lot of difference because we're there, and uh, we can be there today, or we can be there next week, or we can be there next month. But whenever you are thrown into a site and you know you've only got three days to get what you're going to get, you got to bounce around a whole lot. And we didn't know anything about the site. We didn't uh, we didn't get to do any research on the site. And what little research that we did do on Thursday night uh, turned out to be not exactly right because we were showing a railroad that uh, crossed the river there and, and came through that property, and uh, it was it was a distance from there. I don't know what happened to that uh, topographical map there, but uh, our info was wrong, wasn't it? It sure was, and then. We were very excited uh, about the railroad tracks running through there. And then, of course, we were talking about trestles. And, of course, I'm sure everybody thought we were crazy. Well, the locals anyway was like, well, I don't remember any trestles running through there. But I talk, I did talk to a local, and uh, I mentioned it to him. And he said, no, he said, there's no railroad tracks ever come through here. And then, of course, I was telling him about uh, the historic aerials, uh, the to- uh, topo map um, had railroad tracks coming through there. And he said, well, that's wrong. And then actually on site two on uh, the historic aerials, it didn't even have the old house there. So, I mean, we kind of thought something was iffy about that. And then, uh, but come to find out that map was, it was uh, 18, what, 1897? Something late 1800s was was where it was. And it showed it, it showed it to come up through an actual little holler there. I mean, when we got to the spot where it was showing it come through, uh, it was conceivable that there could have been a railroad track there. And, uh, yeah. actually to the North, I guess it was North. I don't know. To the North of that was where most of the New York buttons were found to the South of that was where you and I on that very first day that we went up there, uh, I found a uh, burn side with half the case and still had some paper and it still got some powder in it too. I got it cleaned up a little bit. And then you found a uh, suspender clip. So we thought, man, you know, we, we've hit on a real good spot here, but, uh, mm-hmm. how hard was the wind blowing that morning? Man, I bet it was blowing a hundred miles an hour up off that river. i tell you, it was blowing so hard. It had all the leaves cleaned off of most of the hillside. But as you first start going down the hill, the leaves was like five foot deep because where it blew all the leaves up in one big pile. And, I mean, it was it was blowing, wasn't it, Seven? I mean, we just – I mean, I got wind burnt, and, uh, of course, the wind coming up off that river was pretty cold that first morning, first and second morning anyway. It so, was – I mean, it was, it was brutal. It was very cold. In fact, I finally told you, I said, we're going to have to find us another spot before we get a little bit of wind break. Now, if we'd have been finding something, it would have probably been a little bit different. But uh... oh yeah, yeah, it would have. We would have warmed up pretty quick. And I know uh, one thing. Of course, we had the GPXs, and we went up there in that thicket at the uh, the New York camp. And I mean, like, what'd you say? A rabbit walked up and then looked at it and shook his head and turned around, and went back. It was so thick. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> what I said. Of course, I was just joking, but that's how thick it really was. And uh, you it know... was it was thick, and then you get in there. And then, of course, you have a hunter right here and a hunter there and a hunter there, and everybody's using GPXs. And then you can imagine GPXs with, I mean, being 10 foot away, you're going to have interference. So we had to run and cancel a lot, which uh, you're losing some of your depth and cancel. So, yeah, I mean, it was it was rough hunting there for a little while. And then everybody finally 
scattered out and found their own little pockets and stuff. And, uh, of course, if they ever have another DIV here, I'm sure people's going to find a lot more stuff because they know where the pockets are. They've got better ideas. And, uh, of course, up behind the uh, headquarters, uh, there was a wooded area, and some of it wasn't marked to be on the property. And at the pre-hunt meeting, he said he didn't even know they owned that. So I got off in there, and I walked probably three miles in there, and the only thing I found was a uh, horseshoe. But, I mean, it was so thick, I mean, you couldn't really hit every place. So there's no telling what's left in there. You, know, you just got to find it. And there was an old rock wall going through there. So, I mean, it looked like a neat place to hunt. So, I noticed that Gary Heckman just put in there that he's uh, trying to find an ox. And uh, anyone got any hints on 800 only? Uh, I don't know, Gary, if you're trying to, if your question there on that is uh, which detector should you get, a 600 or an 800? And Jeff and I have been talking about that today because we're both probably going to look toward getting one of those. Uh, As Tim Henderson just said there, an 800 is real hard to find right now, but many dealers do have the 600s. And now my understanding, I, I may be wrong on this. By the way, quarter hoarder just come in. Hey, Jason. Uh, my understanding on this is that what you get with the 800 that is not on the 600 is the ability to uh, break your tones where you want to. If you're familiar with a CTX, you know that you can... Uh, redefine your tones and what I mean by that you can put a slot in on on nickels from say like 11 to 14 and make that be a high tone if you want it to be instead of that mid tone and I used that a little bit on my CTX when I first got it and then I abandoned that I just went to straight 50 tones and another difference in it is that the 800 has, you can put, uh, you can run all five frequencies, and I think it's 5, 10, 20, uh, 40, 60, uh, 50, I don't know, something like that. But anyway, uh, you can run those individually. Now, you can only run three tones uh, individually on the uh, on the 600. Say if you want to just run in... Uh, or frequency. Say you want to run in uh, number five frequency, you can do that. Or if you want to run in 10, you can do that. But my understanding is, uh, and I listened to Debbie from uh, MindLab, and I understood her to say that if you run in multi-frequency on the 600, you're actually getting all five of those frequencies. You can just only manually put it in the lower three of those. So if that's the case, mm. I don't need, uh, I don't need the... Uh, the headphones, the wireless headphones, because I don't, I won't, you know, most of the time I don't use headphones anyway. And so, uh, so I don't know. But Gary Heckman says some 600s yeah. have coil problems right out of the box. I hadn't heard that. Uh, yeah. Well, Gary, uh, I was checking earlier, and they are two 800s on eBay. Uh, right here, uh, I clicked over to eBay, if I could find that. Uh, code i would send you i just put it in the uh comments but uh here's one uh 1350 or best offer and this is uh equinox 800 and uh here's the equinox 800 and uh it's got one bid for a thousand dollars so there's two of them on there and then of course they're a little bit more expensive than you would uh find a buy a new one so yeah what what is the new 800 run what like i thought i seen like Right at nine hundred dollars. Yeah, I think eight ninety five, something other like that. So they're making, they're buying yeah. them and putting them on there and and reselling them and and making some money off of them. Uh, hopefully, yeah. we yeah. will have another dealer of Mind Lab close to us before too long. And you know, I'm not in a mad rush to get one. I'd like to get one fairly soon. But uh, another thing about it, yeah, is I've got a. Go I've got to use that new coil I got for the AT Pro before. I get a uh, Equinox, so, but yeah, I'll, I'll get one soon, uh, as soon as we get our uh, new dealer around here, so, yeah. but uh, anyway, I got I need that snake coil, and uh, I'd like to try it out on a few home sites. I use that uh, snake coil today. Uh, I bought one off of uh, Tim Henderson, 
And uh, by the way, don't let me forget, we need to run his bumper as soon as I get finished with this right here. Uh, and we've got a call coming in. Let me pick that up before I do anything else and add them to the group. Uh, looks like 9302. Who we got? Hey, Lloyd, this is Woody. Uh, hey, Jeff. Uh, just want to call. Thank, Woody. thank you, guys. Good, guys. I want to thank you for what y'all do. Uh, I got one quick question. Well, we really about, appreciate uh, it. Okay. Uh, DIV sounded good. It wasn't probably exactly what y'all wanted, but remember several episodes ago when y'all were at that construction site, we dug all those bullets when they were piling the dirt up on the hill. Is there any other mm -hmm. construction site going around? there that y'all could hit maybe because that was a good spot right there is, is it a, well see like the, i've seen a, a few i've seen a few construction sites up in virginia and uh the way they uh talk that they won't let anybody metal detect the construction sites hardly and uh, of course actually i heard a story there was a farmer that was putting a new road through his property and uh, was moving a lot of dirt and was having people to guard it where they couldn't go in there and try to save the relics. Now, that's that's pretty crappy, if you ask me. I mean, yeah, he's going crazy. to destroy the relics anyway, and why not let a few select people go in and save these relics while they can? I mean, they're going to be gone forever, and, I mean, they're going to be in a dump or something like that or wherever they move that dirt to. And that's pretty yeah. crappy on the landowner's part of not letting somebody come in there and save them relics. So. Yeah, that's that's just kind of ridiculous in a way. I mean, and uh, one more question: the my lab, uh, it's not eight hundred. I I'm a Davis fan, but I love the way that sounds. And I just wonder: is that going to be the next generation? Is that going to be it right there? Do you think or? I'll say this about I mean, I'll say this about the comparison between uh, the Equinox. There was an Equinox 800 that was being used at this DIV hunt, and there was a Deus being used. Now they may be in the wrong place because if you weren't in the right spot, you weren't finding anything. But the Equinox picked up probably five times more what the XP Deus did, or the Hunter was that much more successful. Now again. Uh, it depended on where you were at because I had a GPX and uh, and Austin Cooper had a GPX young man that I met him and his uh, dad uh, Troy I believe was his name and uh, met those guys and we all had the same machine and both of those guys they killed me but they were in the right spot so I don't know if you you know I'd like to see right. a head to head yeah. uh, uh, you know comparison between the XP Deus and the uh, the Equinox on some sites that I know of around here and just kind of see how they go. Hey guys, we need to stop for just a minute here and uh, run this ad and we'll be right back. If your passion is metal detecting, then you know how much your success is based on the equipment you use. Let my buddy Tim Henderson of Murray Branch Outdoors in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, help you with that. Tim is an authorized dealer of Garrett, XP Deus, Tesoro, and micro detectors and supplies. He also carries a variety of aftermarket coils. Murray Branch Outdoors is not only competitive in their prices, but the service after the sale is second to none. You know, We've all experienced those situations where we purchase a new detector and then we get out in the field and we have questions about settings or operation of that particular detector. Well, I tell you what, with your purchase from Murray Branch Outdoors, you're also going to get Tim's personal cell phone number. That's right, his own cell phone number, and you're just a quick phone call away from getting answers to those questions. Now try that with some chain store purchase of a detector. Murray Branch Outdoors also deals in used detectors, and he'll give you top dollar for your trade-in whenever you decide to upgrade. So give Tim of Murray Branch Outdoors a call at 615-948-4611 and tell him Relics Radio said hey. 
I don't know if Woody hung up or not. He uh, There was a uh, thing on this computer here that was asking to uh, do video, accept video on that, and uh, accept or decline, and I declined the video part of it. Might have hung up on you. I don't know. But anyway, they were, we were talking about the uh, Mind Lab Equinox, and I think the one thing that sets this machine apart from all other VLFs is that you can run multi-frequencies at the same time. And uh, that is, and Tim has put it in here, it's uh, 5 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz, 15 kilohertz, and 20 kilohertz, and 40, uh, that the 800 adds to that, uh, which is great for small gold nuggets and what have you. But uh, I was impressed with what I seen, when it, wasn't you, Jeff? Oh, yes, most definitely. I mean, I talked to a guy, of course, I, uh, I talked to him from the balcony and was talking down to him. And I mean, it was, he was very impressed with the, uh, Equinox. Uh, actually I can't remember how many bullets he said he'd found with it, but he said it, that it impressed him with the depth of the bullets and, uh, separation, uh, in the, uh, iron. So, and of course them, uh, multi-frequency, I mean, I, I mean, I feel that's going to be the, uh, new to new detector to go to. And, I mean, you get, you got all them detectors, I mean, in that one detector. So, I mean, you've got, well, even the F-75 is single and the uh, AT Pro single frequency. and But, I mean, you've got all them frequencies working together. And there are going to be a lot of stuff pulled out of the ground with these detectors. They are. And, uh, Tim, you're getting some questions on here. It probably wouldn't hurt you to call into the show and uh... – yeah, he's uh, he put his number up there. I, I did. Seen I, I seen him th- that he had put his number up there, but uh, uh, we welcomed him to call in so that uh, we might ask him some questions, and some other people have some, some questions as well. Uh, up to you. You may be eating supper. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't. Well, here he is right now. So we're just going to add Tim into the group. And uh, all right. Hey Tim, how you doing tonight? Hey. Hey, good. Can you how's it going, Tim? I can hear you good. good yeah. All right. All right. Tell us a little um, bit. Tell us a little bit ta- more. I hadn't talked to you in a while, Tim. <laughs> yeah, it's been a little bit. I don't know if I can see the chat <laughs> while I've got this call up. I don't know if I can multitask with a tablet and with my phone or not. But uh, I had a question there about the uh, XP Deus and the manual. Um, I got the XP in and I field tested it for a little bit, but when when I got my hands on the Equinox 600, I sold the XP. Um, you know, just too much to try to do at once. But the the manual it came with the the older manual, but they have a sleeve, a page sleeve that's in the manual that updates it basically to the version four or 4.1. Uh, and all it is is that it addresses the high frequency coil mainly because that's the only real real difference i guess is that high frequency coil and they've done a little different on the display where you've got that xyz uh display so i hope that answers that question on the xp yeah i hope so too i uh i don't know anything about uh, xp dais but uh you know i talked to you and and my big decision was whether to go with the xp dais because i know it's a fast machine I know that there are a lot of relic hunters that are using that machine and that uh, you can, uh, you know, you can update it online and it's got a lot of good qualities. And I know that uh, uh, Matt Perdue has got one and he likes his and uh, Butch Holcomb has got one. He likes his and, uh, you know, you you can program it a lot of different ways. In fact, Keebs. Uh, I've talked to Keebs uh, with Stealth Diggers a number of times, and he said that you can actually make that dais into any com- uh, metal de- detector you know that you want to, uh, whether it's an AT Pro or whatever. And I wasn't aware of that, so I was just kind of trying to figure out which uh, which I wanted. But I like the idea of the multi frequency running at the same time, don't you? Yeah, I tell you, basically the XP and the um, the new Equinox, they are the same thing with the exception that the Equinox is running the multi-mode simultaneously. Um, you can do all of the same features in both both units uh, as far as your tone breaks and 
setting your tone frequency, setting your response time or your recovery rate on the coil speed, um, you know, toning your iron back, notching, everything's pretty much the same except the, X, the Equinox has the uh, multi-frequency. So with that said, that's got a lot of guys. I know of a couple already that are looking at putting their XPs on the market or just kind of putting it in the back seat for now. They're really really liking the multi-mode on the, on the Equinox. Um, pretty much, you know, you, you can just very uh, programmable, but I talked to a couple people. I was trying to make my XP sound like my AT Pro or run like my AT Pro, and it just got very confusing for me uh, trying to do that. A lot of it has to do with the with the tones. You can get them pretty close and everything. I really needed to spend more time with it, but I had promised that demo unit to a fella, and then right after, you know, about the time I was getting ready to sell it to him, the 600 came to me, so I just went ahead and let that go and then i kind of did the same thing with the 600 i just went out and put it in in field two mode and i just started hunting with it and it started making sense after about about four hours i got a little grip on it and then the next day out about another two or three hours it started making a lot more sense and of course the third day i hunted with it with it was when you went with us and it really made a lot of sense. you had a great day but yeah you had a great day that day yeah, don't so, uh, sure I mean, don't say anything about that because that's next week's video now. <laughs> For you, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you Ryan, may you Ryan, may have already Ryan. seen uh, dig dogs, but uh, I've got one yeah. coming out Tuesday. Yeah, you had a great hunt, and once again, right where the car was parked. So, lesson learned. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't learn that lesson, Tim. I I drove all the way to Virginia, and rather than just get out of the car and start detecting there, and if I'd have done that. I'd have had that Confederate reef. I'd have had two or three large scents, and I'd have had a couple of reals were found there. So uh, I, I must have a hard head. Well, we'll see. Know, that's where you, that's where you go. You, you you a lot of people they'll find most of the good stuff right at the vehicles, and I mean then everybody has to walk three miles to a Civil War campsite, and there was a lot of good stuff found up there. Don't get me wrong, but I mean that guy sat right there at the parking lot and i mean the way my back and hips are anymore i guess that's what i'm gonna have to start doing just just pick uh pull up to the parking spot and just get out and start detecting so <clears throat> it's funny it's funny you mentioned that lloyd because actually the thought went through my head we got out of the vehicles and you and ron i mean i guess y'all already had your detectors and pouches still on driving over there because y'all hit the ground running. <laughs> <laughs> i didn't even have time to get my sandwich out and i looked around and i just saw dust and so i sat there and ate my sandwich and had one of your cokes out of your cooler i hope you offered that but <laughs> <laughs> i did and, uh, i did you you I can give my, me the five dollars my... next time we get together you can give me that five dollars there we go there we go but I, I actually had that thought. I said, you know what? Wouldn't it be cool if I found something right over here by the truck? And that's exactly why I started right there in front of your truck. And he found a uh, bucket lister, and he multiplied it by five. Uh, the same thing. Yep. That's all That's all that I'm going to tell you. And Matt Perdue said it's like fishing. The best spot is always on the other side of the lake. And that's exactly true. Yeah. I've I've run a yep. lot of gas out of uh, out of my boat trying to get get that ranger over to the forest spot over there. You know that always looks better. But this uh, this hunt was a spot hunt. How many bullets did that guy find in one hole there, Jeff, on the last day? Do you remember? I do not remember. It was uh, it was over a hundred. Uh, it was over a hundred. I know. And I was thinking it was 104, uh, 108, I believe. 108. Uh, yeah, man. I believe it was 108. That, uh, but that was not indicative of that hunt. I mean, one of the one of the hardest things to find on that hunt was a bullet. Now there were a lot of, uh, the, you know, don't get me wrong, there were a lot of bullets found, but they were really, really scattered. And uh, on the uh, on the Vermont camp, they also found a couple of ID uh, tags, didn't they? Mm, they sure did, and I mean they they were some great finds. And uh, of course, uh, that's on top of my bucket list, and I'm sure on a lot of people's bucket list is uh, the uh, is an ID tag. And uh, of course, 
I've found a lot of World War One and World War Two dog tags, but never a Civil War dog tag. So, I mean, and uh, what about the uh, the uh, button that uh, that uh, kid found that was his fourth uh, relic ever? Yeah, uh, let me tell you something, guys. This is a great story, and this is gonna it, it will be in American Digger magazine. The button will. I don't know how old the young man is, but he had. Uh, uh, and Jeff put a link to it there on my treasure spot. But uh, he, this was only his second hunt. He had hunted with his dad one time prior to coming to DIV. And if you go to the very back of the site, it was a it was a hundred mile walk. But there were two or three colonial houses and an old mill down by the river, and that's where they went. And there was actually a sword found in a chimney that was standing there. The blade had been broken and reinserted into the handle backwards. Uh, I don't know what the deal was on that. But this kid, it was only his fourth relic that he had ever found. And he found a CS uh, button. And tell him what that button looked like, Jeff. Um, it had an eagle and uh, in the shield it had CS. And it had 17 stars for the uh, 17 Confederate States around the edges of it. And it was just a... Uh, just a flat button. It uh, it was a uh, staff officer's button, and I mean it was a beautiful button. I mean, of course, you could tell by the picture I just posted that they hadn't cleaned it up yet, real good. But I mean, it, it was still a beautiful button. I mean, it was a it would have been a bucket lister for anybody. Anybody. I mean, it was. They call it a C C S seventeen. I believe is what the button's called in the Alberts so, book. I th- yep, yep. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's in. I, I think I heard Butch say that that's what it was was in the Alberts book. What's that button worth? Well, I seen one that was uh, on a button mm-hmm. form that was for sale, and they, they was wanting a thousand dollars for it. And I mean, it was about the same quality. It looked like as the button he'd found. So I mean, it's a thousand dollar button, and I mean. They paid for his hunt, he paid for his dad's hunt, and so I mean, there you go. <laughs> and they can go back again, too. Uh, yeah, they here's, sure can. here's what Earl says about it he says, CS staff officers button R17. Jeb Stewart staff passed through there five times during the war, according to John K. So, uh, huh. not for sure what the Albert's number is, but I'm definitely sure that that was the find of the hunt. In fact, John and Rose put that in the top 10 of finds for all 40 DIVs. So that says something about it. Yeah. Well, Earl said uh, he bet it would be a little bit higher than that, so higher than $1,000. So Yeah. Yeah, it was. But we, uh, got to th- we were talking dog tags just a minute ago, and Gary was talking about a uh, – wanted to talk about uh returning some dog tags and i was gonna let him know i've tried to contact a couple of family members that own well that these dog tags belong to and i cannot get a uh, response from them i don't know what the problem is i don't know if they think it's a joke or what but i mean i've been trying to get with them to return these dog tags to their family members but i mean they will not contact me back so Ron, Ron tried to return some too, and he he met with a similar response. They just weren't interested. But in this day and age, it seems like with all the scamming out there, that's one of the problems. And then there are are people who just uh, you know maybe maybe that person's passed or they didn't have really have a relationship with them. So there's a lot of reasons. But then you know I don't know what the odds would be, but one out of so many is going to be a static to get it. So I think it would be worth the the negatives to find that one or two that, that really makes their day to get that. Most definitely. Yeah, most definitely. And Earl. So I'm uh, just waiting on that one person. Earl brings up a good point. If you're going to return a dog tag, send them a picture. And then they don't think that yeah. it, it's a scam, you know. And <laughs> that, yeah. Well, see, I've located a lot of them on Facebook. And, then, of course, it's right there. I mean, I've posted pictures. And, then, of course, they pretty much just ignore it. And, and I don't know, like. Tim said, don't know if they even knew they had a grandfather or relative in World War One or World War Two. I mean, you know how 
you know how kids are these days. I mean, if it doesn't have a joystick to a video game, they could care less about it. So, unfortunately. Well, I've got a couple that I couldn't return, and so I saw it fitting to bury them in my test bed, just put them to bed. Yeah. Uh, Jim yeah. with uh, Dump Site Digger's got a question here, and uh, I'm going to attempt <laughs> to answer that. And uh, we covered it a little bit earlier in the show, but it's worth repeating. He said uh, he heard that the GPXs were not as effective on this hunt, maybe too powerful. Uh, Jim, what we found out was that this is not true cull pepper, red, hot soil. Uh, it was pretty close to neutral, maybe, maybe a little bit hot in some spots that you went to. Plus the bullets were relatively shallow. And what most people were doing was running their gain way too high and they're running their iron reject way too high. And, uh, so the bullets that you were going over were nulling. It was like a big piece of iron. And if you, uh, what I did, but I didn't do it until two days into the hunt was turn my gain down to four or five and then turn my iron, iron reject down to, uh, down to four. And then me and Jeff went with a six inch coil and, uh, that, that helped us. But you could have hunted this site with a VLF machine, and there were a lot of them there. Uh, our partner, Earl from Virginia, he used his MXT, and he did great. So uh, that's uh, that was the situation there, don't you think, Jeff? Yeah, I believe it was. I mean, it's uh, I've tried to run a uh, VLF at a Brandy Station. Uh, we run up on a real trashy area, and, I mean, it was – totally just i mean terrible i mean you everything was iron i mean it was just uh i mean it was real real noisy so but this other farm i'd hunted a uh farm in uh, orange virginia one time it was pretty good i used the f-75 and you could get away with it there like you could on this past div 40 and that like you said there was a lot of vlf machines there and uh, of course i'm pretty sure that's why earl he could go through the iron better, better than we could. So, Well, that that's the comment he put on there. He said discrimination from the iron was the key at this hunt, and it really was. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was the uh, spring hunt that we went to last year? What property was that? Uh, if you hadn't asked me, I could have told you. Uh, Gleed's Farm. Yeah, Gleed's Farm. That's where, uh, yeah, that's where I found the... Uh, uh, Virginia state seal button. That was by far my best button that I've ever found. Yeah. And, uh, of course we found several bullets and, uh, of course there was a few pits. I mean, it was a winter camp. So, I mean, you'd expect to find more bullets and they were dug in. So you would find the trash pits and the hut sites and stuff like that. So, but I mean, I know, uh, I seen John, he'd posted, uh, on, uh, my treasure spot. I think it was, uh, a couple of years ago, maybe last year, that uh, he picks these winter camps because there was so much activity there. And you get a big group of hunters, like 500 people. That's a lot of hunters. And these farms that they camped at, they had winter camps on, they still have lots of relics on them to this day, even though they've been hunted 10 times by a big group like DIV. And you can go there to this day and still find good relics. So, I mean, that's why he likes to uh, hunt the winter camps. Yeah, they're definitely better. And uh, But what I was going to say about the Glebe Farm last year, I took my CTX and uh, I hunted most of that hunt with a borrowed TDI, a White's TDI PI machine. And uh, Randy let me borrow his. But... Uh, you know, and I did well with it, but I tried my CTX in the field and it was absolutely useless. And then me and uh, Jeff went into the woods and I found my best bullets in the woods with CTX. So I, I think, of course, you got all of the layers of, uh, of leaves and all of that kind of stuff in the woods that you don't have in the field. So it's obviously not going to be as hot, is it? 
Yeah, it's not it's not going to be near as hot as it was would be out in the field. But you ended up doing pretty good. I forgot you used your CTX in the woods, and then uh, what was you found? Uh, you was finding some gardeners in the woods, weren't you? I was finding gardeners and found a trench there, and uh, found some gardeners and found some uh, buckles and stuff up there. So I was pleased with uh, with it there. But then we finished out the last day. Uh, up there where we found so many fired bullets. And, I mean, you just you just kind of gritted off and walk, and they were just everywhere. Now, I didn't have that machine set up right. All I could hear was low tones and not high tones, so I did not find a button. And uh, that was my yeah. fault, but I didn't know any better, you know. I didn't know how to set the machine up. But uh, I did. Yeah. I, I I cleaned up on bullets at that hunt. Then, I mean, like we normally, we find several, several bullets, uh, but like this hunt, this time, I mean, they were just scattered here and there and we didn't run our call over any, I, well, you did, you found a uh, few bu- uh, bullets, but I didn't find my bullet until uh, we got in that trash pit and I didn't find it with a metal detector. I found it with a pin pointer. So <laughs> there you go. I know it. And, uh, guys, let me tell you a little something about that. Uh, we did a uh, Facebook Live. It's not the greatest Facebook Live that's ever been done, but we did kind of document it. But I found a spot up on the New York camp that was absolutely full of everything. And there were people that were trying to hunt it, and there had been a few New York buttons come out of that. And on up the hill, there were a lot of New York buttons come out. So uh, me and Jeff, we just decided on the last day, about the last three hours of the hunt, we're just going to hit that, uh, what we think is a trash pit and, uh, just go through it. And we dug down maybe four inches and Jeff was already finding ash. And, uh, my first, uh, find, I found a suspender clip. I found a a four hole sewing button, a trouser button. And I can't remember what all that I found. And then Jeff found a suspender clip and, uh, I found a button, but you could not hear, any of those signals you couldn't pick out any of those signals with a detector and they wasn't anything there deeper than six inches were they it sure wasn't and that uh tell them about the uh boulder and the uh big log that uh we uh moved Uh, it was uh me you and uh what was the young gentleman's name? I keep, I, Austin. Well, I met so many people this weekend. Austin. Yeah. yeah, Austin. I met so many people this weekend. I can't keep up with their names, but uh, Austin. Uh, His tell d- them about that boulder we moved. It was a size. It was size of a Volkswagen, wasn't it? <laughs> they was. Uh, there was a, a guy up there, and uh, I had been off a little ways of hunting, and uh, we uh, we were hunting around up there, and and. I sat down on this rock. I actually sat down on the rock where the trash pit was and uh, sat down there for a minute. And there was a guy come over and he said, is it time for a break? And I said, yeah, I've done a lot of walking. I'm going to sit down here and eat me. I brought a sandwich with me in my bag and, and drank me a Coke. And, and he said, well, I just wanted to come over here and meet you. Uh, I watch you guys all the time and he wasn't aware of the radio show, but uh, he said, I watch you guys on YouTube all the time. And me and Jeff got a whole lot of that. I mean, we, we've met a lot of people that uh, knew us that we didn't know them, but we do now. But anyway, he, uh, he came over and said, I just want to shake your hand and, and tell you, we appreciate everything that you do. And, and uh, so he was using a, a GPX and I talked to him a little bit about how he had his set up. And he's, he's the one that actually told us a lot of the bullets were nulling. And then he said, my son, uh, Austin, he's 19 said, he's doing real good up here too. And he said, I want you to meet him if uh, if he ever comes back. Well, me and Jeff went off to another spot to hunt and uh, kind of met up at another place. And then we came back and, and his boy, well, actually his boy met me because I hung my coil under a, a little vine. And uh, you know how that will <laughs> throw you off balance. And I was trying to get the coil unhooked from the vine because it's a brand new six inch coil and I don't want to break it. And I'm off balance, and I'm trying to save the detector, and I'm stumbling, and I'm not looking, and there's a down tree there and a limb, and I hit that. There wasn't no way. I mean, I was holding my detector up in the air, but I busted the ground. And there's a young man up on the hill, and 
I, of course, first thing you do when you fall is look around and see if anybody's seen you because about all you hurt was your pride. <laughs> and uh, I did that, and uh, I, I picked up, and uh, then he, he come running down the hill. I said, no, I'm okay, I'm okay. Don't You don't, you don't have to come up here and, and uh, help me. And he said, uh, no, I just recognized who you are. I want to come down there and shake your hand and meet you. But he found a lot of buttons up there around that tree. And uh, so we came back. We and, came back. Uh, I don't know how I got that echo. We came back there, and and this tree was there, and a great big rock. And so uh, Jeff said, "Let's let's move this tree, and uh, see if there's anything under it." And Jeff went down there and said, "Let me film." And he said, "I just want to see how uh, everybody to see how big that this thing is," and. Uh, so we walked over there and I filmed that big, or he seen the big rock and it, he's not lying. It's as big as a Volkswagen. So we hollered down the hill, everybody get out of the way. And we roll that rock. And then it took three of us and we finally roll this big tree out of the way. And what I find, uh, two percussion caps under the thing after all that work. I believe so two percussion caps, but this tree, I mean, it was, I mean, it was size of, uh, small tractor tire well front end tractor tire and i mean it, it was a big tree to be rolling around but i mean we got it rolled over finally and then of course after rolling the boulder over i was scared it was going to roll all the way down the hill and crush somebody but we caught it before it went too far and <laughs> we we made it where it wouldn't roll any more any further uh by accident so but yeah we got that big log flipped over and all we found was two percussion caps and then then we started well, I went and I started rolling over uh, boulders, and then uh, I did end up finding, uh, I believe, I did find a general service uh, button under one of the uh, boulders. So, I mean, yeah, you that found, did help that part. You found that up there at the trench, didn't you? Yep, sure yeah. did. So. Somebody called in and while, of course I was, while we were talking. Somebody called in, and I added you to the group here, but then uh, you dropped out. I don't know if you didn't think you were hooked up uh call back if you want to but yeah uh it uh one guy moved a rock and found six new york buttons under it yeah that was i mean that was a big deal moved one rock and found six up under that was i mean that would have been a rock i would like to found so but you say uh jess rogers he put us Seven in Tennessee, Jeff, for doing a lot for this hobby. I hope you both get your uh, knocks as soon. Well, thank you very much, Jess. I mean, we really appreciate that. I, mean, I hope we, I hope well, we do this too. This is the reason we do this. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, we don't make any money out of it. Uh, in fact, we don't really even. Yeah, go ahead and. Uh, I see Gary. Gary, uh, uh, he was the one that called in, and then uh, we lost you, Gary. Yeah, go ahead and call back in there, buddy. I've uh, I've got somebody just called in. Uh, Twenty two fifty six is your last four numbers. Who we got? That's me, Gary Heckman. Hey, Gary. Good to have you on tonight. How you doing, Gary? Good. Hey, Gary. I wanted to, I want to talk to you guys about returning dog tag and that. Can we talk about it or not? Sure. We talk about whatever you well, want sure. to. Are we live now or what? what? Yeah, yeah, we're live. Yeah, Go yeah, ahead. we're live. Yeah, yeah. I've got my volume turned down, so I can't hear nothing. Just, there's a lot of people. There's some, not a lot. There's some people that do not want to talk about a relative or return dog tag to their father or something like that. I I talked to a guy. I spent four days trying to find this guy's relative, and he died in Ohio. And his son, one of his sons, lived in North Carolina. And he thought I was scamming him. And he thought it was a scam. He wouldn't even tell me his brother's name. I wanted to send him a picture of the dog tag. He didn't want to see that. So what we did was we put the dog tag in in an envelope because somebody else found the dog tag and asked me to help him locate the guy. And we both issued a letter. And we put the letters in there and telling him if he wanted to call us, he can We'd like to talk to him, but he didn't have to, you know. And we mailed the dog tag back. Mm-hmm. We had dog tag for five days, and he never called back or anything. So, you know. Well, there's uh, people that are new. Yeah. There's, you're just going to have to realize that there's people that do not want to know or uh, who are not interested, yeah. you know. I'll tell you, I'll tell you too, uh, um, 
the, the dog tags that we find are typically from the World War II maneuvers that came through the Middle Tennessee area. And most of those guys that lost dog tags were reissued tags before they went into the to the you know to the theater to fight. So that's one of the that's reasons what, people. Yeah. That's that's this one fella, um, Jerry. He found it down in Arkansas, okay, and it was somebody who would go into the. North African campaign, and they lost it in 1943. And that's the guy who I called his son, and he didn't want no part of it. I there's 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 ways to look up people, you know. Like many many years ago in 1992, I got a call, I got an email from a, a treasure hunting club I belong to, a metal detecting club, that a guy in Australia lost a found a dog tag over there at an old abandoned military hospital. And the guy was mustered in in Alpena, Michigan. Well, my grandfather used to be sheriff up there in Alpena. So I called before we had all this free long distance and everything else. I took it by myself and I called all the people in Alpena with the last name. And they took, one guy told me, he says, well, I think the guy moved to Grand Rapids. His family moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan. So I started calling Grand Rapids, Michigan. And the third call, I says, please don't hang up on me. Just hear me out. This is not a scam. But I want to explain something first. The guy said, go ahead. I said, was your father in World War II, and was he stationed over in Australia? And the guy says, no. He said, but I was. I said, you was? He said, yeah. He said, how'd you know that? I said, did you lose a dog tag over there? He said, how'd you know that? He said, I got in all kinds of trouble over losing that dog tag. I said, well, <laughs> there's a guy over there that found the dog tag, and he wants to return it to you. So I given got him information so they could contact each other. The newspapers up there all over did a great big article about it, everything else. They didn't mention me, but that's okay. I felt good just by putting the two together. Yeah, it's great. That story. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> I'd that give was, you know, I, there's, I'd give anything in the world to have my dad was in World War Two and he's passed away now, and I'd give anything in the world to uh have a dog tag or something, you know, from him. But I, I can see people being apprehensive because, as Paul Forsay says, there's a lot of scams out there, and that's probably the first thing that you think, you know, uh, especially when well, we I'll, get the emails that we do and, uh, you know, the phone calls that we do. And, and you have to remember something else. That's true. But there's also there's a lot of people that are estranged from their parents, that's true, too. Okay. You know, there's it people that true. do not want to know anything about their folks or anything else. So I'm just saying, telling people, you know, when you try to find somebody, be aware that even though you're showing happiness and joy because you found the right people, they not, might not be happy to hear from you. That's a, that's you know, a if right. you understand what I'm getting at, huh? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Hey, great sure story do. there, uh, uh, Gary. And appreciate you calling in and, and telling us and sharing that information with us. Can, can I give I you a couple throw... more hints? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. When you're trying to find somebody, I always, you know, if, if you're sure they're deceased, you can go to find a grave, okay? And, and if you find them on find a grave, then you can ask for the funeral home, the cemetery they're buried in, okay? And they usually have a autopsy obituary report, or you can call the newspaper from the town they're buried in. You go to the local library, and they'll do a search for you for the obituary columns that lists relatives, you know, surviving relatives and that. These are just all kinds of places that you can go to. Maybe sometime, if you want, we can do a, a more thorough talk about this. And I know we're almost out of time tonight, but I just wanted to pass this on to people. And I'm glad that you did. And yeah, that's good news to have. Yeah, yeah, that that'd be a good show to have. I mean, just this to help uh, me a lot. Y'all just and there I is mean, a, how to locate people. Yeah, there's, there's another site uh, that I'm on, and I, I get on it. Uh, it's a paid site. You have to pay money to be on it, but it's called Fold F O L D three, the uh, number three. And uh, right. I, I, you're able to look up uh, service. People from the uh, Civil War, World War One, World War Two, Vietnam, 
And uh, you can even look up some uh, census reports and things like that. So that's another good place to go. If, if you have people and you know what town they're in, and you can do a search for the newspaper for that town. And most newspapers have microfilm, and who knows how far back they go, but you can contact a library or somebody or the newspaper, and they can do a search for you for the obituary for that person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Sure can. We thank you for the tips. Uh, appreciate it. Appreciate, okay, buddy. Appreciate the call. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very who much. Who are you? Who am I speaking to? This is uh, Loy. I'm digging with seven. Okay. All right. And Tennessee. A friend of mine, Tennessee Sharpshooter. Do you know him? Yeah. Yeah, I do. I've hunted with okay. him. Okay. All right. Yeah. Good guy. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Have a good night. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Good to have you on. Uh, Woody Jones asked Jeff. He said he's just going to break the ice and ask if he can go hunting with us sometime. Uh, we might be. Yeah, able to... I, I seen that. I was trying to. I was trying to type with one hand, and then uh, of course I'm holding the phone with the other. And uh, I just put. Well, I'll, I'll contact you, Woody, and then we we may work something out there, buddy. So. Yeah, I see that you came up with. <laughs> I'll, I'll contact you. Uh. I put a post in there, Loy, about the Middle Tennessee maneuvers, which is pretty interesting. There's only one book Ron and I have found on it. It's called In the Presence of Soldiers, and that's a pretty interesting read to talk about the interactions of the soldiers who were training here before they went to war and the interactions they had with the with the locals. And I've even got a, a print. It's the letter that the uh, governor sent out to all of the all of the residents of this area letting them know about the maneuvers that were coming and any any damages to property or crops or fences would be taken care of and they had guys come in behind the maneuvers and settle cases with everybody it's very interesting all the relationships that were built um just a lot about the soldiers yeah there's well, a- see actually right here where my house was built uh they had uh their camp one of their camps here and i can go out in my front yard and we find the uh, old uh, uh, World War II uh, cartridges, and uh, I've found a lot of st- uh, uh, great seal buttons and uh, stuff just yeah. in my front yard. So, I mean, we got on two. I never. I mean, here. we we got on two camps down here, just within one within about three miles of my house, and one's actually right behind my house. Uh, there's uh, there was about. I don't know, 20 or 30 foxholes, and there was some type of a tent out here in this field. And then there was another camp just down the road that was one of the larger camps. And uh, we, we lost count of the foxholes. They had built tables out of, uh, out of big pieces of limestone. They'd set them up and made tables and, and had fire pits. And we hunted that place for two years. That was when Ron and I first got into metal detecting, and we found all kinds of cool stuff. And you know, most uh, most of the time, if you are metal detecting, you run up on World War II maneuver stuff. If you look close enough, there's going to be a Civil War campsite somewhere close. They so, I mean, the there's a place. lot of. Yep, of I mean, it was a great place to camp. So, and I know, I mean, we've got a uh, Civil War garrison camp right across the hill from me. Well, actually, it's one. I mean, I've got one on one side of me and the other one behind me, and. Uh, I mean, this was a great place to camp, so, I mean, they're going to be close. <clears throat> uh, hey, Loy, I'm going to shift gears just a minute, if it's okay, and go back to the uh, the Equinox real quick. Sure, sure. Uh, the uh, the 600 and 800, uh, before I called in, I looked up again to just refresh my memory, and it states on the website that the 600 operates in those three frequencies in multi the three lower frequencies, and then the 800 has the, the 20 and the 40 kilohertz. Okay. But those are listed, those are listed for, for shooting for small, small gold nuggets, and I'm talking small stuff. So that's also why the 800 has that gold mode where the 600 does not. Okay. So, you know, and then, then you get into all the tone breaks and all that if you run a really, really customized. But for me personally, living where I live, I'm mostly relic hunting. And I just don't really have a need for those those two higher frequencies because I don't want to dig birdshot and, you know, 
twenty twos and things like that. And that's that's what it's that's what it's set up for. So, but if you're maybe in East Tennessee or something where you might want to do that, or if you're going to go on trips, Jeff and I talked about this, where you might want to use it as a gold machine, then then that's great. Other than that, you know, it's just the customizable aspects of the eight hundred uh, from the six hundred. But me personally. Yeah, I'm perfectly happy with the 600 because it's going to go after everything I'm looking for. That's kind of my thinking. Yeah, but... that does make sense. And, I mean, like with the GPX, I mean, you do get tired of chasing bird shot around and then the little bitty 22 bullets. So, I mean, that's something you have to look at about the eight, the difference in between the 8 and the 600. So. so it's going to chirp that stuff in if it's running those higher frequencies, even in multi. And then you take the XP... That's basically the same thing, but they had to come out instead of adding frequencies to their existing machine with that existing stock coil. What they did when they came out with version four was they added they added the, the higher frequency coil to be able to be programmed in, and then but you basically can't use that unless you buy that HF coil, and that was designed to shoot for smaller targets for the gold things like that guys are having good success in you know in trashy areas you know penetrating and hitting silver and stuff but uh one of the guys that that i deal with here in murfreesboro that is real good with the xp he he got the high frequency mainly because he felt like he was missing silver and he still wasn't 100 percent satisfied that it helped him with silver but it definitely got the smaller targets so there, there again, you know, they're very similar, the XP and the, and the Equinox, but the Equinox just managed to put it all in one package. Plus, they program way easier than the XP, but the XP is still a great machine. It's lightweight. Ohio Relic Hunter is in the house. Hello, Bill. Good to have you in tonight. We, we uh, were iron 16 minutes into this. We started out talking about uh, the... Uh, DIV hunt, but we uh, mentioned there that the Equinox really, really held its own uh, from what Jeff and I saw, and so we've kind of we've kind of converted over, and we're talking about the Equinox and kind of comparing it. But uh, good to have you in. Yeah, I believe after this weekend, I mean, it's convinced uh, Seven and I we we're, we're looking at uh, getting one, so. I think I don't. We're still trying to up in arms about uh, the six or the eight hundred. So, uh, I mean, for the money, I mean, no, no more difference. I mean, the six hundred would be good for what we need it for. So, I think so too. And we're yeah. Ohio Relic Hunter said that uh, we had conflicting shows tonight. We do, and uh, I kind of hate that. But that's yeah. What we our- changed. Yeah, we we changed our time because of daylight savings time, and we didn't realize that we had another show on really at that time. So, I mean, that's... Well, we're not the only I one mean, because American Digger, Relic Roundup, and All Metal Mode are both on, on Monday night at 8 o'clock. So, yeah, okay. it is what it is. You know, I mean, uh, this is the time that we really need to be on, and so that'll... Maybe that will will give us an incentive to have uh, a, a good show each week, and uh, but you got the archive, you know, you can catch them all. And uh, I listen to the mm-hmm. ones that we conflict conflict with too. Uh, and by the way, next week I'll have to look at my book here and see what we've got scheduled for next week. And we're not getting off yet. We'll talk a little bit longer. But uh, next week we have Heath Jones and Scott Duncan. Uh, they have History Seekers on Tuesday night, and uh, then I'm trying to get, for April the 12th, I'm trying to get uh, Digger Charlie and Ninjin from Stealth Diggers. Now, we had Digger Charlie and uh, Keebs on, on Stealth Diggers. I'm co-hosting it for two weeks. Had them on the other night, and they were great. And then April the 19th, we've got uh, Carolyn uh, Warwick with the uh, Central Florida Metal Detecting Club down in Florida. That's going to be a great show because we're going to talk a little bit about detecting and we're going to talk about bottle hunting as well. And while I'm at it, I might as well tell you that uh, I'll be on History Seekers again this coming Tuesday night, and I think that we're going to get Butch Holcomb. And uh, so that'll be more of this DIV talk and some other stuff. I'm sure we'll everybody will talk about the knocks there as well. Yep. 
So, I mean, that's one thing about uh, this hobby. You'll never run out of things to talk about. There's always bottle digging, always uh, Indian artifacts to be found. So, I mean, it's, I mean, you're always going to have something to talk about. And I think that's what hardcore metal uh, detecting was talking about tonight was uh, airhead hunting down in Florida. So I'm sure that that's an interesting show, and I, I want to be sure and catch it and uh, listen to what they say. I've done a little bit of that, uh, done a lot of it, really, back in the day, and I know that you have too, Jeff. I have, and uh, I kind of missed a little bit. I would like, I wouldn't mind getting into it a little bit more. Of course, uh, where I live now, I mean, there's all kinds of Indian artifacts around through here, and we've got uh, the big creeks running through, and actually uh we've got a uh, indian mound just uh walking distance from my house and uh i can't i want to say it's uh around twelve thousand years old and uh of course they found a lot of stuff in it back in the uh, 20s and then now it's an archaeology site and uh so i mean and you can't you can't hunt on that property but i mean you can get close enough to find good stuff so yeah, yeah, you can. And nobody plows anymore. That's a big deal. Woody Jones uh, wanted yeah. to know, is is History Seekers on Spreaker? Yeah, they're on Spreaker. Uh, they're on at 9 o'clock Eastern, 8 o'clock Central Time on Spreaker. Just go to Spreaker.com slash forward slash History Seekers, and uh, you will find that show. And we're just all we're just all one big family. We're not in competition with one another. Uh, we help those guys when we can. They help. They've helped us a lot more than we've helped them, haven't they, Jeff? They sure have. And then uh, you have uh, Beyond Sight and Sound. I mean, they he helped us. Josh helped us a lot, and then uh, he helped us give that metal detector away. So, I mean, like you said, we'll, we'll give everybody. Uh, We'll give stuff everybody else's stuff away, so I mean, <laughs> that's, that's right. pretty good. <laughs> that's right. Uh, yep, we well, sure we really will. appreciate it. Uh, but it's you know it's interesting. Hey, Tim, you still on? Yeah, I'm yeah. still here, but I'll hang up so somebody else can call in. Okay. Well, no, no, I just if if that's what you want, or you can you can hang on, or whatever. It doesn't matter. We had uh, we had five people on at the same time down in Virginia the other night. So it's kind of hard yeah, to talk to that many. I mean, some of them had to sit and listen. But, yeah, let me give the call-in number out again because uh, we uh, we plan on staying here for a little while longer. It's 270-495-0315. 270-495-0315. Yeah, and Jeff has put it in the chat there. My chat hadn't locked up yet. So if you want to call in tonight, and by the way, guys, I sometimes fail to say this, but hit the like button. And if you have not hit the follow button, uh, hit that on our channel as well so we can get our stats up a little bit. Uh, we uh, do this on Spreaker, but we're also on iHeartRadio. We're on iTunes. What what did we say when we hunted with... Uh, with uh, uh, Green... Gr- Green tunes, blue tunes, and uh, Looney Tunes. And Looney yeah, Tunes. Uh, when we were down with uh, Ron and Tim hunting with them down there, but y'all call in. And... Well, no, that was that was at the infantry camp when we had that on the video. So yeah, that we was... were sitting on that big log. That was a big log call. Well, the, sure re- was. the reason I said something about hanging up was my wife was sitting over and she said I talked too much. That that you talk too much. Has she ever met seven? <laughs> Not personally. <laughs> I'm gonna t- I'm gonna tell you something, guys. And Heath, if you're listening to this, Heath said the other night that uh, after the show we uh, talked with uh, with Digger Charlie and uh, Keebs a little bit. He said I I really wasn't on my game tonight, and. Uh, he said, I've just had call after call after call. Of course, it's everybody wanting their Equinox, I'm sure. and uh, But it is hard if you're a host to have two hosts on the show because I I kind of held back, and I think that Heath was holding back thinking I was going to come in and, and do something. That, that probably could have been a better show, but I don't know anything but talking. Well, <laughs> I mean, that's good because I, I'm not a big talker. I mean, as everybody knows on the videos, knows on this uh, podcast, I'm not a really big talker. And I mean, unless somebody asks me a question and then I'll, I'll 
get to talking, but I mean, I mean, it's good that me and you're together. So, yeah, and uh, somebody said Spreaker, Mike or uh, who is it? Woody. He said he uh, didn't know Spreaker had a like button. I guess is what he's saying. And, oh wait, and I'm looking on here too. I guess. No, I guess you just hit the heart. That's right. That's right. Thank you there. Yeah. Uh, because I was I was kind of messed up on that a little bit. It doesn't have a like button. It uh, it has a a heart on there, and if you hit that, well, then people will know that you like our show, and we appreciate you liking yep. our show. Yep. Yeah, this is the reason we do it for the uh, listeners. So. My wife and I watched something pretty interesting. I don't know if y'all guys saw the history, uh, the history uh, documentary thing. I guess it was a three-part series they did uh, about Daniel Boone and the men who made America. Um, oh yeah, I've been watching that. That's great. Wow, that's that tells a lot about how things got where they are. You know, when you when when you're out metal detecting and looking at some of that early uh, early history there. What's the name of that series? I know it. Uh, uh, the men that made of uh, the men that, who made America. Oh, okay. Yeah, it starts out and, with Daniel uh, Boone course, and goes into the Revolutionary War and then carries on to the to the Louisiana purchased territory being purchased and settled and just very interesting on the history of the United States. You know, I wish we had a little bit of Revolutionary War stuff here. We just don't, and it's because of where we're at. Yeah, you know, we're too far west. But mm-hmm. I'd give anything in the world to go up in an area that had that and uh, and get to hunt and hope. I, I'd love to find a GW button. Well, in the oh, west, yeah, that's only, on everybody's uh, bucket list. In, in the west, the the British were pretty good about getting the Indians to fight the frontiersmen for them, so there wasn't a lot of conflict. That's true. That's true. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, Tim, how would you like to go to, uh, what is it, Boonesboro? How oh, would you God. like to go up there metal detected? That would be too <laughs> awesome. That would be awesome. So That would be great. And Gary said, be thankful. Of course, thankful. a lot of these home sites around here uh, that Seven and I have been hunting down here uh, around where I live, a lot of them uh, date back to that time. Uh, we have some forts that... Uh, <laughs> Your local that date back to the uh, seventeen early early seventeen eighties. So I think seventeen eighty four and maybe one seventeen seventy. So Deborah Minnick is hey, on, look- and uh, yeah, we had uh, she had talked about maybe coming up and hunting one day. She said she's fighting a bad head cold, and that we might not get to hunt. Uh, hope you get better soon, Deborah. Uh, and you know, we can, we can schedule a hunt almost, almost any time. I don't hunt on Sundays because of church, but, uh, hunt every other, uh, day that I can, you know, whenever I can get away, not all tied up. Uh, I was tied up this week. I tell you, I, uh, most of you, if you're on my Facebook page, you've probably seen it. I spoke to d- two different, uh, elementary schools yesterday about the civil war in our County. And that was a wonderful opportunity. I get to do that every year and get to tell the kids how the history really was, not what you read in the book. See, I was uh, wondering how uh, that went. I know uh, a lot of your history books want to teach the younger generation one way. And actually, if you read the diaries and know a lot about the Civil War, then you know it went the other way. So. I mean, I didn't know how they would uh, let you teach them if you would let if they would let you teach them the truth or not. So they do. They they are wonderful about it. Uh, our county is made up of a lot of people that are just like us, you know, uh, including our uh, superintendent. We're good friends, and they've allowed me to do that for a long time. I always take some bullets. I took a sixty nine caliber mini and uh, just a variety of bullets and some buttons and. When everything is over, I gave them all a Digging with Seven sticker, and I gave them all a uh, Relics Radio card, 
And I told him, I said, no, you go home and you get on, you get on your computer and, and, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, <laughs> believe it or not, I picked up a lot, you know, me and Jeff did, we picked up a lot of subscribers and things, uh, with that, but they were just blown away when it was, uh, I probably should have filmed it, but when those kids, they were all fourth graders yesterday, when those kids picked up, well, one was fourth and maybe the other in fifth. When they picked up that 69 caliber round ball, their eyes just bugged out and they said, man, that is heavy. I said, yeah, imagine getting shot with that. Uh, man. What cracks I, I seen the uh, I seen the little video where uh, I guess your daughter uh, uh, recorded it where all the kids is like you had one, two, three, and all of them uh, yelled digging with seven. So I thought that was pretty neat. So, how many? You got your little fan club you, there. Yeah. Go. Boy, how many of them ask you if you were in the Civil War? None this time. <laughs> uh, and I always start those uh, presentations out by asking some questions. And not many, you know, four or five questions. And uh, my first question is always what years were the Civil War, did the Civil War occur in? When I first started doing it, I had people say 1970, you know, 1980. And, uh, but this year, both schools that I went and talked to, they were dead on. So I've, I've, uh, been an influence on those teachers because both teachers, whenever I came in, they said, we're ready this year. We've taught them a lot about, uh, the civil war this year that we used to didn't talk about, you know, and, uh, there's Matt Howe, uh, Hey, Matt, if you get a chance, call us, uh, 270-495-0315. I was hoping that you would get in here because I want to talk about uh, your DIV hunt for a little bit. And it doesn't matter if we go on for two hours. I ain't got anything to do but go to bed. <laughs> but anyway, I, I talked to uh, talked to those kids and asked them some questions. And I am excited about how much that they are learning about the Civil War, especially in our county here, and how much both teachers said our kids, since we've been doing this together, have really taken on an interest in history that they didn't have. And I said, well, you know why, don't you? I said, uh, it's because we make it, uh, you know, we we make it personal and we bring it home to our county. This, these are things that happened in our county. Mm-hmm. And that when you can actually touch the relics that come from their county, then, I mean, you know they're going to be more interested in it than they would if they just seen it in some kind of book. So, Yeah, sure is. And, uh, you know, one thing that I found in some research that I've done, and me and Jeff are still trying to find a camp called Camp Anderson, uh, me and Mike have looked for it and, uh, me and Jeff have looked for it some, but, uh, the guy that started that camp was a union sympathizer and he actually footed the money and donated the land for the camp and actually purchased the 1861 Springfield rifle raffles to equip that group that came in there. But then I've also got documentation where that guy had slaves and uh, so I tell them, I say, you know, you're going to hear that the Civil War was all about slavery. I said, it's not. Uh, that was certainly a portion of it. I don't agree with slavery. Uh, and But that is our history. You know, I mean, that, that is the, the case. And many of the Union people actually, or not many, but uh, some of them, you know, they actually had slaves. And so uh, you can't say that uh, that's part of it. Here is Matt Howe calling in right now. We're going to bring him online. Are you there, Matt? Hey, hey there, Kevin. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. We had Matt on live. How's it going, Matt? Good, Jeff. How are you? Just fine. Just fine. Fighting this head cold, buddy. I, I come down with something uh, on the way home from uh, DIV, and it's it's kicked my butt for the last couple of days. And uh, I mean, it, it's... It's been terrible, but um, I'm starting to feel a little bit better. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, I'm glad you guys traveled home safely. Yeah, we ran through a bunch of snow and everything. Hey, we want to hear about your hunt there. Tell everybody uh, on the show tonight how your hunt went. Uh, you know, this this DIV was a tough one for me. I think it was like probably, I guess you guys have talk, 
talked a little bit about it. Uh, I uh, so um, it was me and uh, my good friend Jamie um, Ross Walker, who you guys had on the show last uh, last week, and uh, Bruce Adwell, and uh, that's kind of my my digging group. And you know, the first day, like many people, had a really tough time. Um, you know, the the relics on new sites like that. If you don't have a group of guys that already know where the relics are, somebody's got to find them, you know. Mm, that's right. And and um, it it just took us um, it took us a full part of the first day to uh, to 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 just narrow in on a spot. Um, and I think you guys probably ran across the same thing. Um, but by day two, we had we had kind of narrowed down um, where we wanted to be at on the New York camp. Um, which was a absolutely incredible place. You know, I, I certainly know why those guys uh, picked that hillside to camp on. It was absolutely gorgeous. Are you talking about um, the, uh, y'all spent most of your time back in the grassy field, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was, um, and it, that field was a big deterrent for a lot of guys. Um, you know, they'd walk into that grass and that grass was probably, anywhere from you could put the coal across the ground to eight or 10 inches high. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the way it was. Yeah. You know, you really, you had to earn those relics in there. They weren't easy. Um, but when you did, um, my buddy Ross, he found a little patch and he just got to moving grass around and move, you know, just like hunting in the woods where you start moving logs and stuff like that. He just started pulling grass and moving it. And he ended up digging about, I think, 12 bullets out of about a 10 by 10 area. Well, that was rare. That was rare for that hunt. And I don't know if you noticed it or not, Jeff, but about the uh, second or third day, I looked at Matt when we were walking in and hanging out his backpack was a weed whacker thing, one of those things that you swing. (laughs) (laughs) Well, see, I was, wouldn't it have been nice if uh, they would have bush hogged that little field? Yeah, it, I mean, you know, you, I think I think that would have been a You get that many field. hunters. Yeah, you get that many hunters paying that much, $250 a person. I mean, I would think that they would bush hog a little bit. So, but I mean, it is what it is. I mean, they'll be able to hunt that little portion of the camp for as long as they want as long as they don't bush hog it. So, I mean, well, you know, here here's the amazing part about GIV, and let's talk, I mean, we can talk about any Civil War camp in general. You truly never can hunt it out. I mean, yeah. I, I watch your, your guys' videos of the 44 Woods. How many different machines you ever take in the 44 Woods, and you always seem to go back and pull something out? <laughs> I've, you know, I, <laughs> I've had a lot of machines in there, and different people have had a lot of machines in there. But you're, you're right. Uh, you know, you're not ever going to hunt it out. And uh, that field being like it was uh, probably helped for another hunt there. Some people are, are going to know, you know, where the relics are now. And, uh, you know, they won't waste as much time. We started out, we started out on that right side. And I think y'all did too, didn't you? Back in the back of the New York camp on that right side in the thicket where I said the rabbit came up and looked in there and shook his head and turned around and left. <laughs> yes, sir. I think uh, I think me and you were in there the first day. I found that really interesting shed. But other than that, I mean, I think a round ball came out of that stuff. And, you know, that place probably holds relics that you just couldn't swing a machine to. You couldn't get to them. There was no way to no. get your coil up in. And, you know, me and Jeff hunt thickets. Now, there are thickets, and then there are thickets. That was a thicket. <laughs> <laughs> that sure was. I mean, uh, you, you would have to have a dozier to get through that. I mean, it was. I mean, and it Matt, was terrible. Matt come out with a deer skull, uh, and yeah. still had the horns on it and everything. And I know what happened. He got stuck up in there, starved to death. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably what yeah, happened. <laughs> I couldn't find his way out because I I didn't think I was going to make it out. But, but you you know the way the the way everything was set up when you got back there to that spot and then you came out to the road you couldn't tell what was going on down below you couldn't you couldn't see what you had down down below uh, 
And so I didn't even know that there were people hunting down there. I walked out of the place. Uh, me and Jeff both yeah. walked out. Yeah, well, we did too. I mean, you know, you walked into the to the areas with those rock walls, and uh, you followed the rock walls, and the one veered off to the left, and it certainly wasn't as well built as the as the like the I guess the boundary rock wall, but you just if you didn't know. You, you you wouldn't have stumbled across it. You would have just thought it was like either a, a cattle kind of early cattle fence or or something like that, you know. Uh, but it turns out that's where the really the heart of the camp was. Um, and I don't know if you guys saw it, but once you followed those walls down, you could see defined artillery positions in there. We didn't spend much time in there. We finally did go down in there the last day. And everybody was already gone. You guys had all gone to the dinner. And uh, mm-hmm. we uh, we hunted down there a little bit. We didn't find anything. I got up in the woods up there by the deer stand and did find a 58. We hunted those woods a little bit. And then I finally told Jeff, I said, let's go back up there to where the tree crossed the road. And uh, then back to the left of that. And we actually dug a little shallow trash pit for the last three hours of the day and kind of saved our hunt by doing that. There you go. Yeah, that's where I found my only bullet, so. <laughs> and, you know, that I, I'll be honest with you guys. I was one of the guys who was discouraged at the very beginning of the hunt. Um, but it's that's, that's kind of kind of the, the div game you always have three or four guys who are excellent with the gpx and uh and they've earned it because you know they put the hours and hours in uh and and they're always going to come out with great cases no matter the ground conditions or where they're hunting at iron anything like that but for most of the guys or i would say i'm a fairly average guy i do better some days than others but for most of the guys it, it is kind of um uh, it is can get frustrating, and it's easy to get lost in that frustration sometimes. I got frustrated uh, the first day. I know Jeff got frustrated the, surf, the first day. But uh, Jeff is really good with his GPX, so you not only have to be good, you got to find a pocket. And that was a pocket place. Uh, one hole gave up, uh, I think they said, 108 bullets. And then you you hunt for acres and acres and acres and nobody finds bullets. So you just, you had to be at the right place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I you had to be it. at the right place at the right time. I mean, it was a lot of people just, I mean, you look at a horn bush and uh, Randy Shoal and uh, it was, I mean, a bunch of other that didn't really do good at this hunt that normally do good. But I mean, you just, you had to find the relics. I mean, they wouldn't, uh, like they uh, were just in spots, so. Yeah, some of the previous other hunts, you know, they were huge dug-in camps that they returned to year after year, and you know, you couldn't, you couldn't take a step without tripping over a bullet or a button, and I think that's probably what a lot of people expected. And it's just, you know, with the the last couple of hunts, it just hasn't been that way. But you look at the overall quality of the relics um, that came out during. I'm, I know you guys didn't make it to the uh, barbecue, but there were some truly once-in-a-lifetime finds there, and I think that's what keeps bringing people back to digging in Virginia. I think so, too. Uh, and w- were you surprised when you went to uh, the barbecue and went in and, and saw all the trailers of, uh, of artifacts there? Did it surprise you what you saw? Um, a, a little bit. Um, it was kind of just above what I expected. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of, you know, DIV is that place that you can go dig a core badge. You could go dig an ID tag, or you could just stumble upon just this once in a lifetime relic. Um, except, uh, that the young gentleman that found that exceptional CS button, um, you know, he, he, him and his dad were kind enough to let me hold it and, and get it together so I could put it on my video that I'm going to, post up in a few days um but you know complete sword um the id tag i i kind of expected one of those two you know 10 or 15 once in a lifetime signs and i I was a little shocked that there were a a few more of those than i really thought were going to happen 
Well, that's what everybody yeah, said. Yeah, there were me. a lot of great finds found. I mean, uh, of course, I'd seen pictures from the uh, dinner, uh, the uh, trailers with all the finds, and, I mean, there were a lot of good finds. So, I mean, it's worth hunting again. I mean, everybody's kind of honed in on little different spots, and there's still a lot of relics there to be found. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, for, I don't know about you guys, but we never made it over to Site 2. Um, Mm-mm-mm. We yeah. we went over there one day and I found 158 and I think it was an old colonial house because Jeff found a tomback button over there. But we didn't, well, we spent maybe half a day over there, but we should have just stayed. We should have went up on the uh, New York camp there and just camped there for the whole thing. Because I the, yeah. one, the one thing I wanted was a New York button, and I didn't find one, and I guess there were 50 or 60 found up there, maybe more than that. I just didn't get my coal over one. Yeah, and you know. I wonder, uh, of course, I, I go ahead. No, uh, no, you're good. Um, well, I was going to say, you know, my best day, so I didn't dig a single, uh, a single mini ball the entire time I was there. I dug, um, I had my great day was the second day, and all, I'm not complaining, but all the targets I dug were brass. You didn't dig a bullet. Um, I, I dug one round ball the very first day, and I didn't dig a bullet at all the entire rest of the hunt. Well, Jeff only got one bullet. And Jeff, yeah, but I didn't, I found it with a pen pointer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, found it in the trash pit. What was your best find, yeah, yeah. Matt? Um, my best find was I dug a small size company letter B. That's right. That's right. And, yeah. and, uh, that, that thing is perfect condition. Um, uh, that day I dug two New Yorks, um, uh, an Eagle button, two J hooks, a 57 flying Eagle, um, and then a bunch of mixed brass. Missouri Mike uh, dug a flying Eagle back there too. And, uh, that was, yeah, he, yeah that was a good find. He was about. He, Mike just said he didn't dig any bullets either. Mike yeah, didn't. My chat's yeah. locked up. I can't. Uh, I can't see what anybody's saying. Yeah, uh, I, me, and Jeff actually got Matt's number. Uh, he was on our live show last Thursday night. He was in the uh, conference room. We had the pleasure of uh, having him on the show, and I could tell that he was a very knowledgeable hunter. And so, uh, I, and he's a Virginia guy. So we got his, uh, telephone number and I was actually digging a knapsack, knapsack triangle and at the, uh, New York camp where the tree lays across the road. And mm-hmm. I was filming that and there was a guy up the hill from me and he said, uh, you know, asked me, said, what'd you find? And I said, I found a, a triangle off of a knapsack. And he said, uh, there's a guy back in the back back there that just found a letter B. And I said, are you serious? And he said, yeah, Matt Howe. I said, Matt Howe, I know Matt Howe. And so I just called you on the phone, you know, right there at the hole. Yeah. I said, did you find a, a company letter B? Oh, man, I did. He said, it's great, you know. So uh, yeah. I, I kind of experienced that by proxy, I guess, you know, getting word that yeah. you found that. Yep, and see, Matt, I seen I seen you got to hunt with T Rex. Oh yeah, the, 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 that's right. That's right. Uh, so that uh, I think that was a a good thing to kind of. I mean, we have a good time, you know. Me, me, and all the guys we go to hunt, we don't take ourselves too seriously, and I think that's kind of part of the fun too you know <laughs> yeah that, that that was a good video i like that you have that on your youtube channel right i actually i think that's on the digging in virginia facebook page you know what actually I'll, okay I'll okay that, i will put that on my channel i got two videos of that so if you uh in the next couple of days i'll do probably a, a gone uh an outtakes from digging in virginia and uh, that'll be on my channel gone digging Hey, put your uh, put your YouTube channel out there for everybody to know what it is, and your Facebook group, so uh, all of our okay. listeners will know. Yeah, so my YouTube channel is uh, Gone Digging, and just leave a, a G off the end. And uh, the the Facebook group is um, by my buddy Bruce, and that's uh, Virginia Diggers. Um, and uh, if you pull it up on Facebook, it'll be the uh, Virginia State Seal. We're pretty easy uh, group, going group, and uh, 
Bruce has got a really neat thing he's doing right now with um, letters of the alphabet for relics. Like, so today he started off with A. What's your favorite A find? And uh, there was an awful lot of neat artillery shells posted up. And uh, uh, my buddy uh, Mike put a, his A was for uh, Arkansas. He has a second artil- Arkansas button. That's gorgeous. Uh, but there's a lot of neat guys on there. And they're, uh, they're, it's a group, great group. I actually posted my video Tuesday on y'all's group, and uh, I'm going to start doing that. I I didn't know you had the uh, uh, letters of the alphabet. Does that run daily? Does the letter change, or how often does that work? You know, I think he's probably going to space it out over maybe in the next week, next few weeks. So for one week it may be an A, and the next week it may be a B, all the way, you know, till, till it runs out. And maybe he'll start it over again. That's a good. Um, but I think, I think it's kind of neat. Yeah, it's a good, it's a great idea. Yeah, that is pretty neat. And whenever we get to end, me and Jeff can post on there nothing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Matt, it was great to meet you at DIV and uh, to uh, get to hunt with you and get to visit with you and spend a few days together. And I can see us in the future hooking back up again. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm sure can. It was our pleasure. Yeah, it was an absolute blast. I mean, you guys are uh, nothing but class acts. Well, hopefully, we'll see you soon, at, at maybe at the, in the fall. Okay. Uh, maybe that, or maybe we'll just uh, hook up together and, and uh, do a private hunt somewhere. Yeah, that sounds fantastic, too. I love the, love the opportunity. What we need to do is all hook up and run over <laughs> to uh, – uh, to Matt Purdue's place where we can dig some of those uh, buttons out from under the button tree <laughs> that are in the sand over. Uh, we just invited <laughs> ourselves, Matt, if you didn't know that, uh, Matt Purdue. Uh, yeah. yeah. We just invited ourselves <laughs> to your place. So uh, leave the light on for us. <laughs> so, all right. Well, thanks for having me on, guys, and we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, Matt. All right. Thank you, Matt. Good night. He's a great guy. Real great guy, I tell you. He is a great guy. Yeah, yep. real great guy. And I mean, he's of course I love the T Rex video. If y'all hadn't seen that, I mean, it was it was funny. So I mean, he was. Um, I guess uh, T Rex had found like uh, three play uh, three CS plates, uh, several CS buttons, and he had been uh, metal detecting, but ten minutes. So uh, <laughs> I mean, it, it was it was a funny video. <laughs> So uh, one guy had a uh, drone out uh, flying it around uh, Site 1, and I would love to see that video. I mean, the guy that was flying out, I mean, he was awesome with that drone. I mean, he would he would fly away to the New York camp and fly all the way back to headquarters in the Vermont camp. I mean, it, it's got to have some good footage on it. Yeah, I want to see that too. Uh, Tim Henderson did a great job for us with his uh, drone. And yeah, he did. Food. Yeah, yeah. And you would have got some footage whenever we were together, but you wouldn't have found your bucket list coins. <laughs> but the the wind was blowing, wasn't it? Tim? Well, what, he forgot to hit record button, didn't he? No, no. This well, was part of that. Yeah, the first time when we were when we were out there with y'all, I I was uh, I had done one flyover and got some footage, and then I went to do the second one, and I had gotten comfortable. I really got in tight on Loy and and Ron, and Flew back over you, then I cruised back over to myself and did a flyover. Thought, man, I got some really good stuff, and I looked down and I hadn't hit the record. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's the way it goes. back whenever I was a journalist, yeah. I shot about a, a half of the uh, first half of a Kentucky basketball game. I covered them for about twelve years, <laughs> and uh, I had some great shots. And I, I thought, well, I'm back then. You use film and uh black and white film to shoot with and and <laughs> i went to roll it up i thought i'm i'm surely just about out of film now so they took a television break and i i went to roll my film and it was just free winding there and i thought goodness gracious i didn't even have any film in the camera and sure enough i did so no one no wonder, <laughs> no wonder you got 40 something pictures instead of 36 <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> that old 35 millimeter what was it 36 shots to a roll i think well we rolled our own so we never knew exactly how many that we had on there you know uh you yeah i, I generally try to try to load 
I think about 40 if I could. I'd shoot about 200 pictures a night. So uh, I shot like crazy for the rest of that half and the whole second half and got some good shots. So <laughs> it all worked out. And you got some great you got some great shots too. Guys, it's about time to wrap it up. We're almost up to two hours here. And uh, appreciate everybody that was in the chat tonight. Uh, appreciate you coming Yeah, on. we can't do it without you. We appreciate you. Yeah. Uh, any parting thoughts on DIV 40, Jeff? Well, I mean, I, I had a great time. Wished uh hadn't have brought something home with me. Uh, it was cold-wise, but, I mean, didn't find as much as I would like to have. But, I mean, it was – had a great time. And uh, that would – I know where I'm going if I go back to that farm. So, I mean, that's, I mean, we've got that to look forward to. So, and I wish the uh, guys, the men and women, good luck in the uh, April hunt. Of course, I believe they're going to Coles Hill, and uh, that's going to be a good good hunt. I mean, I've hunted Coles Hill one time, and uh, I remember a guy on the last day, it was in the evening, he got into a, uh, uh, trash pit and he was digging bottles just as fast as he could dig before dark and then uh, they were still bottles left when he uh, had to cover it back up and leave so I hope that uh, gentleman I hope he is drawn for this hunt and I hope he goes back and uh, finds his pit again so but I mean DIV 40 like I said it was uh, it was pretty good for other people it wasn't as good for you and I but I mean hey that's the way it goes I learned more about hunting. I learned more about my machine. Uh, I found a few relics, and I had a great time. We met some great people. Uh, we met people that uh, comment on our videos and everything, and we were able to put a face with a name. So uh, all all the way around, it was it was a great time for both of us. There's no mm -hmm. doubt. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same on these shows. You know, we uh, we love you guys and. Appreciate the support that we get from you and appreciate you coming back each week. Never know exactly what we're going to talk about. We know what we want to start with, but, uh, you know, the conversation goes where it does, and that's fine with me and Jeff uh, because we just love to talk metal detecting. Let me remind you once again yep. that uh, we're going to be on again next Thursday night. We'll have Heath Jones and Scott Duncan of History Seekers. And we are going to dedicate a show. I told them whenever I booked them, I said, I would like for both of you guys to hunt with your equinoxes and to get uh, some experience in the field. So we're going to talk a lot about the equinox this next uh, Thursday night. And uh, then on yeah. Tuesday, I'll remind some of you again that I will be on History Seekers co-hosting with uh, Heath. And I think that we're going to have... Uh, uh, who is it? Butch Holcomb. I think we're going to have Butch Holcomb on. That's not for sure, but I think it is. He was on our show, uh, there in Virginia. And once again, want to thank him for that. And let me plug all these other shows before we go off. Uh, there is, uh, yeah. well, we've got a, uh, we've got a question here for Tim. Uh, okay. Gary wants to know if you want, uh, uh, Gary wants to know if, uh, you want him to call you right now. Sure. Tell them to give me a call when we hang up here. Okay. All right. I guess you heard I'll that. Go ahead. So, I'll uh, go ahead and check on out. Um, thanks, guys. Okay, Tim. Thanks for coming on with us. Tonight. All right. Thank you very much, Tim. Yep. We, thanks we, for coming on. Talk to you soon. Appreciate you, brother. All right. Uh, go check out Josh Kimmel with Beyond Sight and Sound. Uh, Butch Holcomb and his crew with American Digger Relic Roundup on Monday night at 8 o'clock. And by the way, uh, Beyond Sight and Sound is on on Sunday and Wednesday at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. All Metal Mode is on on Monday at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. History Seekers is on at 9 o'clock Eastern Time every Tuesday. And then Hardcore Metal Detecting is on Thursday night and Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. And obviously we're on every Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. So thanks, guys. We're going to get on out of here, and we will catch you next Thursday night.
Thank you so much for joining us tonight on Relics Radio. We really do appreciate it. Be sure and join us live each Thursday night at 7 o'clock Central Time, 8 o'clock Eastern here on Spreaker. Or you can catch the archive show at Relics Radio on Spreaker, iHeartRadio, or iTunes. Please take a minute and hit the like button and be sure and follow us so that you'll get notifications of all of our upcoming broadcasts. You can also find us on YouTube at Digging with Seven or Tennessee Jeff, or you can check us out on our Relics Radio Facebook page. If you'd like to get in touch with us, then send an email to diggingwith7 at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. We hope you'll join us next Thursday night, and until then, get out there and dig some history. Yeah.